Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's clear? Yes. yes. One of the phrases in the slides that Lorraine used for her prayer session just now, when you seek me with all your heart, you shall find me. I thought that was a good little introduction to what I want to talk about today and tomorrow morning. The next three sessions will be a little bit less biographical and a little bit more focused on reflecting on the journey of integration that I believe Janet Stewart embarked on at the moment, at the hyacinth moment that we were talking about the day before yesterday. She was beginning a journey of integration that took her more and more deeply into a prayer of contemplation. It wasn't without its difficulties, as you might expect. You remember that at the very beginning, I quoted the last line of Ignatius's prayer, the Sushipe, in the context of his search for a relationship of intimacy, intimate friendship with Christ. It was that line, give me only your love and your grace, that's enough for me. And I said there were several different possible readings of that. And the first one, which was really the focus of the last couple of talks, which is, let me, God, let me know your love for me. Give me your love and your grace. And I think what is running through today's talks, both of them, is more, give me the grace to love you more. Give me love of you. So that's, if you like, the current of what's going on through, through the next few minutes. Janet's specific search for her telos, her meaning, her, the goal of her life, in the Catholic Church, was triggered in part by a passage in Bishop Allathorne's excitingly named book, Ecclesiastical Discourses for Special Occasions. <laughs> it was not exactly beach time reading. It was a series of sermons given to seminarians. And if you remember, the book was loaned by one of the uh, Catholic family at Exton, where we were yesterday, to Janet's brother Horace, who was playing with ideas about becoming a Catholic. Presumably, this, I hadn't realized how keen the Gainsboroughs were, the Catholic Gainsboroughs were, on converting everybody. <laughs> Building all those Catholic churches all over the county and um, making the whole of their village become Catholic. So this was part of their evangelical outreach. Horace, I think, must have quickly got bored with the book because Janet got hold of it. Anyway, there's a passage in one of these uh, sermons which warns of over-reliance on the intellect when one is searching for truth. And the passage that Janet tells us attracted her attention describes a painting by Rubens in Cologne Cathedral, allegedly, of St. Francis receiving the stigmata. Now, I have spent hours and hours on the internet looking for this painting. 
I think I found it. But alas, it is cropped in such a way you can't see the crucial bit. You can see St. Francis receiving the stigmata, but not what is going on under a rock, which is the point. Because under the rock, beneath St. Francis, apparently, an ugly toad leers knowingly at a white butterfly. And Allerton's point was that the toad represented the human mind, misled by its own cleverness into false knowledge. The toad mistakes the butterfly for truth, whilst the saint, his eyes fixed on God, which receives true enlightenment without any effort as a divine gift. Oh, that it was so easy. <laughs> Janet later recounted that this interpretation spoke to a nascent guilt that she was over-reliant on her own powers of thought in her search for God. Catholicism seems to have attracted her, therefore, at least partly, because she sensed, anyhow, that it would encourage the life of her heart, her affections. Now, as we know, this did not mean that she undervalued the mind. She spends the rest of her life telling everybody, encouraging everybody else in the society to use theirs. But there may have been some sense in her that this other part of her needed more development. A second revealing insight is provided by the anxiety she expressed to Father Galway that if she prayed with her heart as she desired to, it would somehow mean that she was being lazy or self-indulgent. Galway's reply was to encourage her. He wrote, by all means, pray with your heart and tell me how you get on. And later he said to her, in fact, I don't think you need to fear idleness when you pray with your heart. Very sensitive. Now, what these anecdotes reveal together, I think, is a tension within Janet from the start of her voyage of discovery, a tension between the mind and the heart. On the one hand, she was afraid of over-relying on her mind. On the other, she was afraid if she prayed with her heart, she would be guilty of self-indulgence, idleness and self-deception. Her detestation of vagueness, which echoes her father, was made plain to her sisters on many occasions in conferences that focused on teaching and education, as well as those that focused on the spiritual life. And as late as 1909, she was still worrying that any sense of contact with God in prayer was a result of a sort of self-hypnosis induced by an overactive imagination and strong intellectual willpower. At the same time, her characteristic approach to life, and I think this would have been the case whether or not she was a religious, though I expect the training she received in the novelship um, in her time, would have tended to exacerbate this tendency. This characteristic approach to life was to present as much of a finished and as perfect person as a religious as possible. Punctiliousness in obeying the letter of the Lord. Acting as if, you know, even if she didn't feel it, she was going to be charming. <laughs> This was important, but it was not hypocrisy. It may sound like it, but it wasn't. She was an Aristotelian in her moral life, a follower, if you like, of the philosopher Aristotle. In other words, 
She believed and acted on the belief that virtues are acquired through good habits. So, some of you may recognize this. <laughs> so it was important to walk upright and straight even if you felt not very upright and straight because then you would be in a habit of walking in that way and it would become naturally to you. And if you imagine that in, in your virtues of being nice to other people and thoughtful about passing the salt. <laughs> the will, the mind, make a space for the heart to follow. Part of this emphasis was rooted in her upbringing, where good manners would have been insisted on. Also, she was in a position of authority from 1894 onwards, and just as one is trained as a teacher never to be too familiar with one's pupils, she would have felt she had to keep up this self-control and good example not only in her work and her professional life, but in her community life. All of this is by way of introduction to the theme of this section, which is to try to understand Janet's attachment to a particular version of imaginative meditation as a way of praying. In spite of the fact that later she complained of it as, and I quote, out of proportion, cumbrous, and extremely interesting, but hardly prayer. Although he had in fact warned her against overstraining her mind, as to do so in prayer presented obstacles to God's action. And although he had encouraged her to pray with her heart, the version of Galway's training in prayer that Janet recounted to her second, uh, sorry, her third spiritual director, Father Olbert Goodier, in 1909, was that Peter Galway had taught a strict method of intellectual meditation, focusing on detailed reading and note-taking of Bible passages, imagining first-century Palestine. <laughs> But it's quite difficult in those days. It was only the beginning of scholarship into that whole area, so I don't know how she was expected to do that, but still. Um, uh, careful composition of place, preparation of points. Some of this will be very familiar. And so, and so on. And she stuck to this form of prayer all her life, right up to her death. So she didn't... Other things happened. Um, but she didn't abandon it, and indeed was preparing points for novices or would-be novices or people who are having difficulties in their prayer, right up at least till 1912. And just as a little aside, one extraordinary metaphor she uses for this kind of prayer uh, in 1913 is a skeleton. Now she's used it, she means a structure. Of, you know, the backbone, but I'm a literary person, you know, I like close reading of metaphors in texts and things, and skeleton has obvious deathly connotations. Um, so I think that indicates what her experience, in her experience, this particular method of prayer could sometimes become. Father Goodyear believed in, in a very, very, uh, confident, manly way, that she stuck obediently to this old style imaginative meditation until she met him and he sorted her out. <laughs> As a result of her perfect obedience to what she had been taught in the novelship. Now to my mind it is impossible to imagine someone as intelligent and in most respects free-spirited as Janet Stewart, who taught the novices even in 1900 that it was important that they took whatever suited them individually in prayer, to help them pray, and that they should be themselves with God. It's impossible to imagine someone who gave that advice to others to be so literal-minded about herself. Maybe I'm naive. So why did she do so? Broadly speaking, I believe this form of prayer suited her. Imaginative meditation was for her a way of responding to the grace of her initial conversion, 
give me only your love. Putting on the mind and heart of Jesus, give me more love of you. And the discipline of points provided a structure that used her mind, occupied it, and created a space that her heart could then move into. So it was a step along the way of her journey of integration. Slide, please. I've given up responsibility for this machine. <laughs> we get our first privileged glimpses into Janet Stewart's prayer life as a religious from 1894, when she became vicar and superior at Roehampton. In her retreat notes of 1895, she aspires above all to acquire the inter interior spirit and union with the sacred heart of Jesus. And I'm quoting. And therefore, she says, to apply myself lovingly to prayer at all times, to give all my stray moments to prayer, even if it seems to me desirable to think out something. And I'm struck by the word lovingly in this statement and the aspiration to pray at all times, prioritizing it over her attraction to thinking things out. Now I'm quite sure she didn't therefore think it wasn't important to think things out. But she wanted her powers of thought and analysis to have that foundation. In 1899, she wrote to her um, director, Father Daniel, the law is the pedagogue that brings us to Christ. And perhaps I have made too much of the pedagogue. Anyhow, the one thing necessary is the personal service of a personal master. Very evangelical overtones to my, to my ear. And it's important that I pass more and more from the law to the life of this service. She is drawn by a desire to be close to Christ, for her service to be motivated and inspired by that closeness. And putting on the heart and mind of Christ involved for her imagining, empathizing, befriending, consoling, and seeing and loving the world as he saw it, as he sees it. It was, of course, a gradual process. Many of the notes she shares with Daniel between 1894 and 1905 that we still have focus on ideas about self-mortification, making and breaking resolutions, struggles to be faithful to the particular examen, and in eight conferences of prayer that she gave to her community in 1900, she spends proportionately the greater amount of time encouraging them to, be, to stick to their time, to adopt respectful body posture, which usually means straight backs, ignoring their feelings, mortifying their senses, and so on. And during one retreat in, in Grand Coteau, when, during her visit to America with Mother Digby, she spends almost all the time, the whole eight days, meditating on hell. <laughs> it all sounds rather depressing. <laughs> but actually, the full picture is different. Daniel was a good thing. He encouraged her not to take herself too seriously. And far from ignoring her feelings, to attend to all the different ways that the Spirit of God was moving her. On one occasion, very movingly in, to my mind, on one occasion she shared with him how while she was rather laboriously, significant, trying to pr pray according to her plan, a thought had flashed across her mind. It was a good thing. <laughs> a thought had flashed across her mind as if from God. And she says, it's rather playful. <laughs> this thought says to her, what do you want, Esther? 
If it were half my kingdom, I would give it to thee. And she takes this as an invitation from God to have unbounded confidence in him. And she was able to hear this kind of thing because Daniel had encouraged her to do so. He had encouraged her, therefore, not to apply too strictly the rule she had shared with her community at Roehampton to ignore their feelings. From her notes on her 1899 hell retreat in Grand which after all, if we put it in context, uh, Ignatius encourages uh, retreatants during the first week, I think, to, to make a meditation on hell. It was just that she did it for the whole eight days. Um, but anyhow, uh, her notes during this retreat um, suggest that it's clear that all her efforts are in fact to one end, loving God and her neighbour more. And really what she does is focus on um, passages from um, the book of Revelations, the end of the, of the Bible, where it describes paradise, and then she imagines the opposite. So paradise is studied with rubies and things. <laughs> this is me now. <laughs> but if paradise is studied with rubies and crystals, and people are casting down their golden crowns across a shining sea, or whatever it is, what must hell be like? So it's the opposite. So in a way, even though she's meditating on hell, she is meditating on paradise as well. And the fruits are, in fact, uh, sorry, the efforts are all to one end, which is to love God and her neighbour more. And the fruits were all about love and a deeper desire for prayer as a constant, intimate, personal intercourse with God, who lives in me and I in him, as she writes to Daniel at the end of that retreat. We get some insight into the way she prepared her prayer from a little book of meditation points that she put together in 1912 for the use of others from her own notes. This was, uh, the idea for this, at least, was sent as a Christmas present to Roehampton community. She said, this is what I'm doing. It's great fun, and uh, why don't you all do it too? And then you can share your, your retreat note, your prayer notes with one another and have spiritual conversations and it will all be fantastic. <laughs> um, although some of the preparation points are as one would expect from their nature as notes preparing prayer rather than as reflections on what has happened in prayer, rather perfunctory and dry, but others are not. They are fervent and indeed passionate. And I've chosen three to share with you. So can we have the next slide, please? So one of her meditations is on the Transfiguration. And these are the notes preparing prayer. So she's imagining Jesus, or she's going to imagine Jesus coming down from the mountain, full of power, full of sympathy. Coming from prayer transfigured. And her aspiration, exclamation mark, to pray like him. Next tap. Meeting again, this is Jesus, meeting again this world's troubles, waves that beat up constantly and must do so, to meet them like him. Next tap, please. Oh, sorry, never mind, leave it to meet them like him, to meet him in the midst of them, is what she went on to say. Another one, a meditation on Simon of Cyrene, and I have a private thought without any basis at all, except just intuition, that this may have dated from around the time of her election as Superior General, or possibly, but less likely, um, as Vicar. So, Simon of Cyrene, and she writes, The great day in Simon's life, behind him, the sweet country home, before him, the way of the cross. I was thinking about this yesterday, at Ex and Exton wasn't her home, but Cottesmore, when she became a Catholic, and she couldn't return there freely. Following the call was costly. When she became a superior general, many of you will remember 
she went off, she was called over to, to Belgium um, on, to be with Mabel at her deathbed. She arrives, Mabel dies, she gets up from kneeling by the bed, goes to the chapel, doesn't know where to sit, asks one of the nuns there, and the nun says, oh, don't you know, you're the superior general now. <laughs> Obviously interim, but um, as it usually turned out, it permanently, and so that was that. So this sense of shock. In front, it was Jesus who looked at him. Next tap, hopefully, yes. The shock and surprise of it, life all changed. Janet? The strength given him, the love growing, the complete change in all his thoughts. Janet, thank you. Thanks. Give me only thy love and thy grace, for this is enough for me. A figure that Janet felt especially close to, as I've said before, was Mary Madeline at the feet of Jesus. Next slide, please. Struggling with various difficulties during her Latin American voyage of 1901, she writes to Father Damio, Mary Madeline has helped me again. I don't know whether I am right or whether it is presumptuous to think that her relationship with the Lord, so intimate, so devoted, one of the beautiful friendships of his life, is the type of what he wishes my inner life to be. And with her, the mainspring was that she loved him, and then the work arranged itself. Next one, thank you. In these meditations, Jesus is pictured by Janet as wearied and above all lonely and afraid. No one understands. And Mary Madeline? It may have swept over her all in a moment what was going to happen unbearable understanding and sorrow. She had to do something for him to give expression to it. She sought the most precious thing she had and poured it over him. She anointed him for his burial. She meant, I see, I understand, and my heart is breaking. He understood, and she, no one else. And the meditation ends. So the soul to Christ, my soul. Throughout her religious life, Janet longs to make this intimate friendship the mainspring of her own life, sitting at Christ's feet, tranquille, humilié, attentive, as she writes. Sorry about my accent. Peaceful, humble, attentive. So that in her ministry to others, it might be his sympathy that they experience. The meditation on Mary Madeline is an example of several meditations in which she identifies with one of Jesus' companions, trying to empathize with his feelings as if she were Mary Madeline or Peter or a member of the crowd. On the other hand, as she explained to Goodyear in 1909, she found herself often preferring scenes that had little or no activity in them. And many of the occasional meditations that she collects in her book are, in fact, meditations on the words of Jesus or themes of his teaching, rather than, for example, miracles or crowd scenes. The great exception to this were her meditations on the Passion, which she undertook with Alban Goodyear in Lent 1909. It was a sort of marathon prayer fest or we might call it a prayer of them. Um, you can read all about it in Maud Monaghan or ask me for more details. The, my footnote is three quarters, almost three quarters of the page here, uh, and I'm not going to go into all of it now. But she wrote frankly to Goodyear about her efforts to imagine and sympathize with Christ in the Passion, trying to focus on it as the suffering of a man rather than as she was habitually used to, on Christ's divinity. She wanted to meditate on these scenes as I should do if a brother were broken down by trouble. 
On the agony in the garden, she wrote that her heart did not speak at all. I am quite dumb. I should be dumb with the most intimate friend in similar circumstances. But though it is nothing, I think that very dumbness is prayer. For all that is in me goes out to him without reflecting on itself, without any self-consciousness. And that must be prayer, better than most kinds of quietness, a silent companionship. During a later meditation on, on Mary, the mother of God, she writes about application of the senses, apropos of a comment in a book she had been reading that suggested it was disrespectful to take this method too literally. Surely not, she writes. After all, sinners and anyone were allowed to kiss the feet of Jesus and Mary while they were alive or the hem of their garments. She finds herself constantly and naturally kissing the feet of our Lord in prayer. She often kisses the hands of babies of the poor that are brought to her by the portresses in her office, imagining that they are his hands. And so I cannot think he would mind ones doing the same in thought. Now, the book she had been reading, which said it would be disrespectful to allow your imagination to go too far and to start kissing the feet of Jesus in prayer, was by a then well-known Jesuit, a French Jesuit uh, writer on these matters called Père de Momigny. Has anyone heard of him? Good. <laughs> um, and I looked him up on the internet. The internet is wonderful. And it says, to, it says there that he was a famous 19th century Jesuit who wrote on mental prayer. And it was a textbook for 19th century religious in the Ignatian tradition. And he believed in the greater importance of work over prayer. He really thought that basically nuns, I'm quite sure, but possibly Jesuits too, got a bit into prayer and it was a way of avoiding you know, hard work. And so, in the classic faith versus works arguments, he would have been on the side of works rather than faith. So, I think it's very significant and very healthy when in a feisty finale, Janet signs off to Goodyear saying, and this is about kissing the feet of our Lord, in fact, I think I shall go on as usual and not trouble about Père de Momini. <laughs> so, he's in the bin. Room 101, exactly, yes. <laughs> what was the fruit of all this imagination, apart from private fervour? One fruit was that, especially when she was able to share her prayer with a sympathetic other, such as Dania or Goodyear, was that it set at rest so much, I don't know what else to call it, but shyness with our Lord, she wrote to Goodyear. In other words, it seems to have encouraged her in a greater confidence and, as time went on, a dissolving of a rather anxious, uptight self-consciousness in her prayer. Secondly, it fostered in her a strong, clear emphasis on the loving heart of Jesus rather than just on the suffering, martyred heart. And this emphasis communicates consistently to others in her published work as well as in her private letters. There's a lovely bit at the beginning of um, Education of Catholic Girls about how evil it is, I don't think she uses that word, but that's the, the meaning of what she says, to make children anxious about religion and about being good and how everything has to be about fostering their sense of self-worth and, and love and all of that. And I think that was one of the things that was probably so striking to people at the time about that book. She wrote to Goodyear as well that intercessory prayer was one of her main preferred ways of prayer. For one seems to get near to the first things, the most important things, God's will and God's love. 
with his attitudes towards others, that is. When she is praying for others, she it feels somehow in, inside God's compassion, and in a spirit of detachment from her own ideas or plans or hopes for them, praying that his will for them be done. Key here is her description of God's will and love as the first things, the principle and foundation of prayer and of life with God. And she uses, can we have the next slide please, Janet? An arresting image, some of you have seen this before, to develop her idea of the dynamic of this prayer. Nothing represents intercessory prayer so perfectly to me as a bee sucking at the heart of a flower without any words or definite thoughts, to suck the grace from the very thought of God and from the sacred heart. Now there's something to me, perhaps I'm uptight and anxious, there's something to me almost shocking in this image. The verb suck is very physical. One associates it now, or I do, with an intent, focused, physical drinking action Obviously, a baby sucking at its mother's breast. Direct references of that sort would possibly have been taboo for a late 19th century nun writing to her father confessor. But Janet's choice of a bee sucking nectar from the heart of a flower is characteristic of her observant love of the natural world. And it conveys the same idea of a confident, dependent, intimacy with God, an intimacy that breaks down barriers between soul and body. Notice too how this sense of wordless, thoughtless intimacy is derived from a thought, a thought of God and the Sacred Heart. So barriers, I think, are also being broken down between her mind and its thoughts and her heart and putting on the mind and heart of Christ, seeking, give me only more love of you, is what has led her to the beginning of this integration. That's enough for now. <laughs>